Welcome back aliens, my name is Savin Reddy and let's continue with the series on NoSQL. And in this video we'll talk about Cassandra fundamentals. See, till this point we were able to create a table, we were able to uh, insert values and then we, we have seen different data types. And then we were also able to create a primary key, right? And everything was working. But then till this point we have not seen the actual power of Cassandra and then how it can be different from uh, SQL and relational databases. Of course, we have seen the syntactical differences and those stuff, but there's one important thing which we have not talked about as of now, which is distributed. Cassandra is a distributed databases, right? So normally what you do is when you create a RDBMS, you store that in a normal machine, right? A simple single machine. Of course, it can be a big server as well. But then normally we have this tendency of storing that in one central server. It can be at any location, but one server. But the problem starts when you have a system where you have distributed databases. Of course, you know, in relation also we have distributed databases as of now, but then Cassandra is old and it's no SQL and it is foolproof, right? Now Cassandra says you can store data in a table format, but that will be in a distributed database format. So basically you will be storing your data in multiple nodes. And the moment you introduce a term distributed, uh, a lot of things goes wrong, right? So we have to make sure that you consider all the things which might go wrong and you have to understand how Cassandra works behind the scene. So here we are again going to create a simple table just to understand what I'm talking about. So again, we'll drop this earlier table which we are working with. So it's a drop table aliens. Of course, it will take some time. And let's start from scratch now. Now this time also I will create a table. See why I'm creating a table now, again, we have done that before, right? The thing is, when you design your table, modeling your data is very important. Modeling your table is very important. So let's go back to SQL. Normally what you do in RDBMS is you create tables and then whenever you have data which might get repeated, so what you do is you normalize, right? So example, if you have an employee table, you have employee ID, employee name, employee salary, and then you mention department. So what you normally do is you create a separate table for department so that the data, the department data will not be repeated multiple times. So we do normalization, there are different formats of normalization, but then the problem is if you want to fetch data, that's very important. When you want to fetch data, it will take some time because when you combine multiple tables, you use something called join and it is time consuming. And second, you might be having huge table, right? You might be having huge database and fetching data with multiple tables with joins will take time. And we are living in a world where you need data instantly, right? You don't even wait for a second, right? So example, when you go to Google and when you search for something, you want data in a fraction of a second. Even if it takes one second, you will click that button multiple times. We are impatient. We want our data very, very fast. So if you have something like this, having joins is not a good idea. So of course you have to store your data in a denormalized way. Now you, you might be saying, hey, that will be data will be repeated, right? That's fine. Actually in Cassandra, what we normally do is you purposefully repeat data so that it will be easier for fetching. I'll tell you what I'm talking about here in some time. So what we want here is when you create a table, you have to make sure that you design your table in a query first format. Don't think about how do you store data? Think about how will you fetch data? What is your use case? Example, when you build a website and when you're finding aliens or programmers based on their skill set, So of course you will apply a filter. I want alien based on technology. I want alien based on the location. So those are your queries, right? So design a table in that format. For example, if I create a table like aliens, so what type of data I can have here? First, let's go with ID itself. I can say UUID and then I will say a name, which is of type text and let me also have a technology which is text again and let's have one more which is location only this four and then of course i want to have the primary key as well now question arises: how do i design my primary key here what should be my primary key of course id makes sense right if you don't have an id column let's say you don't have id column you have email you have first name last name right something like that in SQL also we have used this. We use something called composite key. When you mix multiple columns to create a primary key, right? Something like first name, last name, uh, maybe movie's name and directors. I mean, of course you can mix multiple columns to get one uniqueness, right? Maybe department and location. So let's say if you create an employee table and if you have a different department table, uh, so you can have a department name and a location. So of course we can have multiple departments repeated in multiple areas, but for one location, you will have only one department. Let's say IT, Bangalore, that's one uniqueness, right? Something like this. 
for one company I'm talking about. So primary key, I can of course mention ID here. Now ID becomes a primary key, right? But then what you can also do is, you can specify location as my primary key. I know that sounds weird because we can have multiple agents with the same location, right? And in this case, we can specify multiple columns. I can say, okay, I have location, I have tech and location, uh, not location, uh, it's ID. Now you, you might be saying, what's the advantage of this? Anyway, we can have used only one column, right? Even that works. Even if you use ID, even that would have worked, right? Or maybe you have a use case where multiple columns, when you combine it, creates a uniqueness. In this case, we don't have it because you can have multiple A names, we can have multiple tech location at the same time. But maybe you can have a table where we can combine multiple columns to create unique value. Now that is called a composite key or the compound key. Uh, so in this case, what we're trying to do is we're creating a composite key. Of course, ID alone is enough, but what if it is repeated, right? As I mentioned before, ID can be repeated, can be, okay? That's very important because it's a limited size and in, when you have a limited size of text or string or number, it might get repeated. So what we are doing here is we are creating a composite key. And the moment you say enter, now this table here, uh, something is missing. Okay, one extra round bracket is missing. Okay, so now this table is a bit different. If I say select start from aliens, and you can see we got a table and location is a primary key. Now that's weird, why only location is a primary key? Now actually location here is called a partition key. So we have a primary key, we have a partition key, right? So this location here is called a partition key. And this tech and ID here is called clustering key. Now why this is important? Let's get with it. Okay, so let's insert some values and let's see what happens when you do that. I will say insert into aliens location tech ID a name. Values I would say India tech is Java. ID I can mention UUID and a name is let's say Naveen. Now that is my first row. Okay, I missed a O here. So that's my first row. Let me insert some more rows here. So I would say this time I would say again India and technology is let's say blockchain with UUID. I would, I would say Kiran. Let's say Australia. So we have these four values, right? And when I say select star now, you can see location is getting repeated as well. So we have two aliens who are from India and then they have a different technology. But if you observe, we are basically having different locations. So you can say we got US, India and Australia. In India itself, for this particular two rows, we have both these columns sorted. So even if you have inserted Java first and then blockchain, you can see it is coming blockchain first, then Java, right? So basically what we are doing here is these two things we have, which is location, tech and ID. This location is a partition key. Tech and ID, they are clustering keys. Now let's see what that means. Now basically when you say Cassandra is a distributed database, so what happens is you have multiple nodes. Now this node can be at any location as I mentioned, right? It's a geographical distributed databases. So maybe you have something in India, you have something in US, you have something in Australia, something in Europe, maybe in Africa. So you have different servers in different location. And of course I can arrange them in any format I want, but in Cassandra, just to represent them, we normally go with ring topology, not exactly topology, it's not a physical topology. Imagine this is a ring and I'm not good at drawings, but imagine this is, a, this is a circle, right? So basically what we do is we store our data in different nodes. All these things are nodes. And what you do is when you store data, example, this is in different location, maybe this is preferring to, this is at US location, this is in India, this is in Australia. So when you store data, what you can do is if you have a huge table, let's say, 10,000 records, 1 million records. Instead of storing huge table in one node, uh, you can actually distribute table in different uh, nodes, right? You can create multiple segments of your table, right? Uh, so what you can do is you can create a particular section here, right? This is where you will be having only US data. So basically what we're doing here is very simple. So let's say you have a table and you have huge amount of data here, right? Uh, you have location, uh, technology, ID, and A name. Now, when you have this data and when you want to store this data, in Cassandra, it is a geographical distributed database, right? That means you can say you can have your nodes, your machines, your peers in different locations, different geographical locations, maybe India, Australia, US, in that matter. So when you store your data, you push your data to a particular center, right? Now don't you think when you have huge amount of data, like maybe millions of records, instead of storing them in one machine, we can create a small segment of your table, right? And you can store it in one node, something like this. Let's distribute the data. All the US data goes to US server. All India data goes to India server. Something like this. Not exactly like this, but something like this, right? Maybe you want to 
uh, create these partitions based on the technology. Maybe you want to do the partition based on the names. That's your choice. And that's why I mentioned different use cases have different results. In this case, maybe I want to partition based on the location. So we can create multiple partitions based on the location. So all these aliens belongs to one location, let's say India, we got US, we got Australia, and that's how you distribute this. Now the advantage is when you fire a query, when you want to search, you are just hitting one node which will return this data because we have limited data now, right? Which only related to that particular location. It will be easier to fetch. And that's the importance of the first value, which is a partition key. Then the next two keys, which is clustering keys, are actually only for sorted values, right? So even if you say US or India in that format, uh, in India as well, so the next column, which is your tech, will be all sorted for that particular partition. And ultimately, it will, it will be a unique value for the entire row. If what if you have two names which are similar, Navin Navin, in that case, the ID will be sorted. So that's how you use the partition key and the uh, clustering keys. Now you will say, okay, when you have this node at one location, what if the node goes down? In that case, you don't have just one copy, you have multiple copies, but you don't see that on the image, right? So let's add some copies there. Now, how do we add a copy? Now, this is where you, you go with something called replication factor. So when you say replication factor one, that means you'll be having only one copy of that data. But if you say replication factor two, you'll be having two copies, three, three copies, four, four copies, five, four, five copies. So in general, we go with factor three, which is a safe bet. But of course, depending upon the type of data you want to work with, you, you might need multiple replication of it. So three works. So maybe if you store data here in this one node, you can copy the same data to the uh, next two nodes for the replication factor uh, three. But then with this, it all makes sense, right? So every time you store data, it will not be stored on one node. It will be stored on multiple nodes. But that also creates one issue now. What if you want to fetch value? So when you insert value, it might go to one server. Of course, at one point, it will go to one server, right? And how do you know in which server you want to store? So basically with partition key, it creates a key value. So every node here will have a token value. Now this token uh, value, randomly we can assign the values. So based on your token key value, it will assign to a particular node, right? So it has a different working behind the scenes and different algorithms, but just to keep it very simple, you know, this is not a Cassandra full-fledged course. We are just trying to keep things simple. So here we are, what we do is we get a key and based on that hash value, we basically find a node where you want to store this. But how do you know that which node you have to hit? So in this cluster, basically, your request can go to any node. Now, all the nodes here are same. They have equal rights. They have equal feature. So every node here in this cluster has one feature called coordinator. So they behave like a coordinator. So example, if your request goes to the any node, that particular node knows to which node we have to send this based on the key, right? So they will say, okay, go to that node, right? Uh, and how they do that with the help of a protocol called gossip protocol. So they use a gossip protocol to share data and to know all the information about metadata about the network or the cluster. Okay, that makes sense, right? So now you know which node to hit, but then we have one more issue. When you hit a particular node, you want multiple replication, right? So let's say you store in one node and it, it might take some time for the other two nodes get to get updated. Maybe there was some issue with the network. Or maybe there was some issue with the system, right? It, anything, anything can go wrong, right? And then someone is trying to fetch data, not from the node you updated, but the node which is not updated yet. And that's where the problem starts of consistency, right? So we have not talked about cap theorem yet, but then Cassandra basically follows availability and partition tolerance, not consistency because that is tunable. So basically here, what we're trying to achieve here is I want to have eventual consistency, or which is tunable actually. Uh, so what you can do is you can specify what type of consistency level you want. So maybe if you, you want to fetch data any, from any node for, out of these three, that's completely fine. You can say one. If any, any one node responds, I'm good with it, right? You can also specify the consistency level as quorum. So let's say when you insert data and at least one node responds by saying done, that is one, and you're happy with it, that is consistency level one. But what if you want to go with all? So when you save data, all three nodes need to give you that heads up, hey, it's done. That is consistency level all, which is very good actually, but then it might not be available because all the tables are getting updated. And when now when you try to fetch, you will not get the data. So it is not 100% available. So what's the best way? You can go with something called quorum. So let's say when you have three nodes, uh, out of three, if you get two nodes who is responding, you've got a column, right? Uh, so that's how you can specify the consistency level in Cassandra. 
And by doing this, what we're trying to achieve is you have multiple nodes in the cluster and you can partition your data in multiple nodes. And at any given point, you can add extra nodes and you can distribute your partitions. And that's the beauty of Cassandra. And of course, one node will not just have one partition. You can have multiple partitions, as I mentioned, right? We can have different replication. So that's the beauty of Cassandra. Distributed partitions, faster, and we don't use joins. Very important, right? Uh, so that's it from this video. I hope you enjoyed. We just talked about the fundamentals of Cassandra, nothing much. Or basics of Cassandra, you can say. So that's it from this video. Bye-bye.